you like that? Okay, guys. So, it's okay, you don't have to be in it. It's okay, Andrew. <laughs> I mean, it's here. You're comfortable. You are. All right, so um, I want to talk to you a little bit about. Um, you know, we live in Manhattan. We have a lot of. Can you start recording? It's done. <laughs> Uh, we live in Manhattan. We uh, we have a lot of expensive places to live. So when it comes to rent prices, Manhattan probably wins all. But what I'll talk about is holy spaces and the impact they have on our lives. The holiest space in the world. Thank you so much. The holiest space in the world is obviously the country called. Israel. And in Israel, it's Jerusalem. Jerusalem. <laughs> and in Jerusalem, it's the old city. Hotel. The Temple Mount. Yeah. Temple Mount. Yeah. And on the Temple Mount, it's the Temple itself. And in the Temple itself, it's the Holy of Holies. And in the Holy of Holies, it's Aaron. the Ark and the Ark. And the Ark was actually a golden box. And inside that golden box was a wooden box. And inside that wooden box was another gold box. And inside that gold box were the original Lucha, the original tablets that were given to Moses. And the first ever Torah that was written with the hand of Moses himself. Some say it was put inside the box. And some say it was put on a shelf outside the box. On top of that box, hi guys. On top of that box was a golden cover. And on that cover, made out of a solid block of gold, actually, was chiseled out two birds with the face of humans. Different opinions what those original faces were. Some say those faces were the face of a young boy. Some say and a young girl. Some say it was an older face with a younger face. Different opinions. And they personally, these were angelic <clears throat> creatures that were placed on top. The wings of these birds came up and crested on the top. And there was a small gap in between these two wings. And that gap was actually the holiest place in the entire universe according to Judaism. From it, the prophecy from God came out and went out into the tent of meeting, it's called the Ohel Moed, and that's where Moses received his prophecy from. The greatest prophet received it from that. So it came out from that. Now, there's so much symbolism put into this. You know, I used to speak about this. I think this is not so relevant anymore, but I used to call, like, you know, the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark. People that heard that movie still? Oh, I don't yeah. feel so old anymore, thank God. <laughs> it was actually based upon this arc. Steven Spielberg made a movie, it's a fictional movie obviously, but the premise was a true premise. The premise behind the movie was that the Nazis wanted to catch, the, capture this Ark, why? Because whoever had the Ark won wars. That was the legend that went with it. By the way, I saw this movie again after like, I mean, like 25 years recently, I was on a bus, and they showed it on those like TV things. It's so dated, you're like, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. Like the special effects are like Harrison Ford like being dragged by a truck. You know, it's a full CGI and all the rest of it. Um, but still a great movie, you know, it was a classic of its day. And the premise is based upon a true uh, reality. And as we say it, we sing it in the synagogues when the Ark is open, when the Torah turns out, Vayhi bin Soharon, Vayom Meshem. Right? And when the Ark, the Aaron is this Ark I'm talking about, this golden box, with a wooden box, with a golden box, with the original tablets inside, was taken out. All the people who came opposing us were pushed away. And actually when we travel through the desert, poles were actually part of the Ark itself. There were two poles and it was carried by Kohanim, by priests. Actually, according to our tradition, it was so holy, this box, that it carried the carriers. No set, no sab. It carried the carriers. According to one opinion, when the Jewish people went into the land of Israel with this ark, with this Aaron, the Jordan split, the Jordan River, you know, you went down Birthright, you went down the Jordan River, you remember that whole thing on the rubber dinghy thing, like a three hour ride, right? Half an hour in is fantastic. One hour is like, okay. Two hours, like, but three hours, like, I'm done. I'm like shriveled up into a, a raisin. And, uh, 
according to our tradition, actually, not only did the sea split when we left Egypt seven days later, but the Jordan sl um, splits as well in a different way because the Jordan is flowing. So it kind of came to a stop and it made a big, big, big mountain of water, then came back down again. And according to an opinion, not all opinion, one opinion says actually that the ark flew over it. That's what they say. So this ark had very powerful properties to it because it contained within it the Torah. And when we traveled, we actually followed it. In other words, when the Jewish people traveled in the desert, they followed this ark, literally like went, and they, oh, time to go. And they kind of like went into formation and they kind of all like followed, following this ark itself. So this ark, whatever it was, really had a major impact upon us as a people. And the metaphor, obviously, between that was that we were following Torah, right? Because, you know, the Torah is moving and we're kind of following it. That was the idea. So it helped us win wars and it gave us direction. And that was the way we knew it was time to travel. So for 40 years, our ancestors are traveling out of desert following this box when it comes down to it, you know, and... Uh, I mean, it was used much later on. Eventually, it found a permanent residence in the temple. Um, question, where it is it today? That's an interesting question, which I'm quite fascinated with. I have different opinions as to where it is today. Some say it wasn't actually available for the second temple. By the end of the first temple, it was actually secreted underneath uh, in the temple mount, in the mountain itself. You know, for future use, there were scales going to be taken. Some say it was actually carried to Rome. And actually, look at the Arch of Titus. You see, there's actually the, uh, it's embossed with the, you know, the, you've seen that image before, right? I'm sure you've seen it, carrying it out. That's what they're carrying out. You know, I'm talking about that image, right? Some say it's in Rome. Some say, you know, that together with the menorah. We'll talk about that a little bit later. That was carried out to Rome. Probably not. Just that image was like taken that we're capturing Jerusalem. But they probably didn't have it at that point or had some kind of replica of it. We're not too sure. Uh, the question I want to look at for a few moments, um, which is pretty fascinating, is that we know as Jews... I mentioned this before, we're very not into idol worship, correct? Graven images, commandment number two of the Ten Commandments is no graven That's what we synagogues, there's no like, you know, image that protrudes, I mean, you can designs in the walls or the, or the windows, but there's no real image, right? You walk into the church and, you know, he's up on the wall and his mother, the whole right? Everyone's up on the wall, everyone's like hanging there and there's like idols everywhere. We Jews are not into idol worship, we're into American idol Worship, <laughs> but we're not to idol worship. So the question I've always been fascinated by is why do we have these at the holiest place in the entire universe, right? Above the Torah, not even below it. On top are these two angelic looking figures made of solid gold. Seems like inside the box itself it says, don't make graven images, right? Don't make images because a person can think, begin to think that that image has power. Idol has power. And by the way, don't think people involved in idol worship are crazy. Right? They, they knew, they saw things inside the tree, right? Inside the, inside the image, whatever it was that we don't see. They understood things so much. Like they saw a holiness in certain things. They weren't crazy. They were wrong, but they weren't crazy. I mean, the thing we had, the real problem we had with idol worship, the number of them, the main one was that most of the idol worship was done via child sacrifice, which we Jews were actually against. Right? One of our big things. Huh? Sounds weird, Charles Sackler, who does that? I mean, it's still done to this day. People still bring their children as they, you know, willing to blow themselves up and say, ah, that's what God wants. Abraham actually spent most of his life telling people, don't kill your children for God. God doesn't want you to die for him. That's easy, you know, put on a backpack and blow yourself up, right? Fly a plane to a building, that's not the Jewish way. Jewish way is we want to live for God, okay? So here we are, and it actually says, don't make a graven image, and then on top there's a graven image. It's like... It's weird, right? Is that, is that a fair question? Everyone like, you've heard it before, I'm sure you recognize these kind of images. What is it about, you know, Jewish people and this kind of idea? So I want, I want to share a little idea with you. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the, um, the biggest fight that ever happened in Jewish history. Now you thought it happened to your, you know, you and your mother, right? Jewish mother and yourself, when you wanted to, I don't know, get an earring or something, or suggested getting a tattoo maybe, or wanted to go on vacation to Africa, I don't know. Right? Or buy a new pair of shoes. Whatever it was. That was, probably was an epic battle. But nothing beats the fight I'm about to tell you about. Because the fight I want to tell you about was actually the fight between Moses and... I don't know who Moses had a really big fight with. Korah. Uh, that's true. That was a disagreement for sure, Korah. But that was a bigger one. 
and it was actually between Moses and the angels, whatever that means. And it happened when Moses went up onto the mountain to receive the Torah. Right? We know the Jewish people left Egypt, the Jewish year 2448, that's 3,328 years ago. And 49 days later, we found ourselves at Mount Sinai, actually, we were there a little bit before, in preparation, waiting to see the Torah. Right? Sound familiar? Yeah, Pesach story? Okay, fine. Ten more of it, that's what happened. Anyway, there were our ancestors right around the mountain, and Moses went up to the mountain. And according to the Midrash, that's certain uh, traditions that were handed down, oral traditions that were handed down, while Moses was up there, God was about to give him the Torah. Actually, he asked the other nations whether they wanted it, and they all said no for various reasons. That's another discussion, not for now, but it's fascinating. Other, Jew other nations were offered the Torah. They said, not, not for us. <coughs> and then Moses, do you want it? He says, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll take it. And the angels turned around and said, no. No, don't give it to them. And I was like, why not? It's like, because you guys are going to mess it up. You're going to take it, and you're going to... It says in the Torah, don't steal. You're going to steal. True. <laughs> we steal. Right? Whether it's things or time or affection. I don't know. Things are not be taking. We steal. And you're going to steal. And it says, don't murder. And you're going to murder. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, no matter what you say, you're going to end up doing it. And then it says, don't commit adultery. You're going to commit adultery. <laughs> Let it stay up here in the spiritual realm. The metaphor of this is very, very deep. Let us stay here in the spiritual realm. Don't take it down to this physical earth where you guys are going to take the whole thing and mess up being Jewish. It's a fair argument. Mm. And Moses had to fight back. By the way, in case you think this was a small battle, the deeper sources tell us that each one of the, whatever this means, each one of these angels, the size of each one of these angels was three times the distance from earth to the moon. Now, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but it was probably terrifying for Moses, right? And he, you know, he took on the fight for us. Right? It was worth being appreciative just for that. So Moses around and said, listen, you're going to keep it up here in the spiritual world? Right? Tell me, you angels, do you have a desire to commit adultery? Right? No. Do you have a desire to steal? Right? No. Do you have a desire to do anything bad at all? According to Judaism, angels, these spiritual energies, whatever they are, yeah, they're not bad, but they're also not good. They're just like spiritual robots. So they just get the job done. Interesting, in other traditions, right, outside of Judaism, they see angels as great beings, so impressive, right? Angel, of course, they're an angel. In Judaism, we're actually not so impressed with angels. They work for us. You see, many times, certain references in the mystical thinking, but not even, even the basic uh, interpretation, Abraham, I, they were telling angels what to do. They work for them. I mean, I don't have a personal angel that works for me, besides you know, <laughs> my wife. But uh, we don't know what that actually like, that means, but they were able to control, harness them. We're not impressed with them. We actually see angels on the same level as animals. One are purely physical, one are purely spiritual. We humans are a mix of physical and spiritual. We have to overcome various desires. We have to overcome the desire to steal. We have to overcome the desire to commit adultery. We gotta overcome, that's our struggle. It's a real struggle, you know? We gotta overcome the desire to, you know, curse out a friend, right? A person upsets you, whatever it is. There's a thousand things that happen to us all day, every day. So why exactly? Angels don't have that. Angels don't deal with that. They just do. Animals don't deal with that. Animals just work on instinct, right? Nothing wrong with them. They just get the job done. We humans have to do. And that's what Moses pretty much said to them. And it took a week get this point over, I believe. One week battle in order to, eventually, the angels relented and said, fine, we lose, we understand, you need it. You're the ones who have this desire, so you're gonna need this blueprint, if you will, the Torah, to help you overcome these desires. You need to have some direction. And that's what happened. That's why we have Judaism, right? Because of this big, epic fight that Moses took up. The question is, what were they thinking? I mean, they're angels. They're spooked. They know what's going on. They knew we were meant to get it. They knew the Jewish people were to become the Jewish people. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob were promised it, right? Sarah, Rachel, you know, Rebecca. They knew, everyone knew that we were meant to have this thing. So why exactly did they need to put this whole, like, fight on for us? What exactly is going on over here? I don't want to... Has it an answer to this question?
Does everyone get the question? Is that a fair question, first of all? Are we following it? There's, there's no way it is the most of you, but... Thoughts, questions, before we try to delve in a little bit. Jacob. Um, I guess, are we talking about the, the oral law or like the written law? No, I'm talking about the written one. I'm talking about the main five books of Moses, as they're referred to. Right. So I guess I'm wondering, like, when when God, like, prompts the Torah, he, like, wasn't specific and meant the or and, like, the angels might have meant, like, oh, he mean the oral law and not the written law. Could have, no, no, I'm talking about the actual, the whole Jewish thing, the whole way of the law, everything you want to know. Shabbat, I don't know, kosher, Israel, everything we get. Everything we get. Angels were like, nah. And we're like, yeah. <laughs> and that's really what we're talking about. Weird, right? There's a lot of depth to this whole story. It's not just like a cute story of an argument between Moses and angels, right? It's something deep, deep happening over here. So I'll give you one interpretation of it, and we'll see where we go with this. And then we'll look at the, the structure of where this thing was placed and maybe why Israel plays into this Jerusalem and all the rest of it, okay? So we'll tie it together in here. So there was a... Um, so called the Dubno Magid. Magid is someone who like gives over stories and uh, metaphors and analogies. It's called the Magid, right? The speaker. The word Haggadah to tell over. Right? Haggadah, we read on Pesach, he tells over the story, La Gid. So a Magid is someone who gives over stories. So he was a very famous one. Every generation there's always famous ones. So one of the his name was the Dubno Magid from a place called Dubno. Very, very famous. So he gives over the following story. It's actually a true story that happened in order to explain this, this piece. And it goes like this, it's a fascinating story. The story is told of a rabbi who was a rabbi in a small town in Poland. And he had a community, like yeah, a synagogue, a temple, you know? And people would come, I shouldn't say temple actually, you know? You shouldn't call it, you should call it a synagogue, or a shul, you know? Or a bet knesset. Temple is actually coming as a replacement to the original temple in Jerusalem. So I don't actually like the term temple, but you know what it refers to. So he has this little synagogue thing, you know, a little shtibel, whatever. And um, he was there for a few years, and he was very successful. And then there was a bigger synagogue in the town over, and they were looking for a, a rabbi. So they approached him, and they said, listen, you've been there a lot, but you're a, you're, a, you're a good guy. And they'll find someone else. Come to us, and you become the rabbi of our synagogue in the next door town. So he felt a little, you know, he was flattered. But he felt bad leaving his community. So he made a meeting with the heads of the community. They sat around and explained the offer that he had from this bigger synagogue that was going to, you know, pay him more money, more congregants, a bigger opportunity, make him more, you know, famous, you know. And they heard him out and they said, yeah, we're here. You know, in your position, we do the same thing. This is like, this is a step up, you know. You're going from Microsoft to Apple. I don't know what the, uh, you know. Yahoo to Google. This is like a big thing. You want to take this opportunity. You should, you should definitely do it. So he said, listen, I can't leave right now. Can I? He said, no problem. Take, take a few months. Close up your affairs. Put everything away, you know, and then you'll come to us. He said, thank you so much. So the few months went by. He closed his affairs, sold his house, packed his stuff, you know, gave his final speech, all the rest of it. Everything went for it. The day to leave came. And the story goes, true story in this. He packed up his carriage with the horses. You know, it's like, probably like your ancestors, you know, went around, you know. Not 200 horsepower, one horsepower, you know. And he packed up the carriage with his bags, you know, and he's got his wife in there, he's got his kids in there. And he's about to leave town to go to the next town. And suddenly he hears from behind him, no, screaming, hollering. And he turns around and he sees half the town descend upon his carriage, banging on the door, holding onto the horses. One dude was lying on the floor, crossed arm, not letting the horses go anywhere. What is going on? And they were screaming, how could you leave us? How dare you? We need you here. And they're banging and banging. And he's totally perplexed. So what is going on over here? So he manages to get out of the carriage Closes the door, leaves his wife and kids in there, goes back into town, and he sees the head of the community sitting around the table, almost like waiting for him. And he sits down and says, what is going on? We made an arrangement, we signed the papers, you agreed to let me go to the bigger opportunity, bigger job. And now 
you set the community upon me like this? And they say, oh, that. Oh, that's nothing. So, what do you mean it's nothing? Well, I'll tell you what happened. You see, we realized this was a big opportunity for you. How do we just let you go? What would have happened? The next town would have thought, you know what, this rabbi, he ain't so good. They were quick and eager to just to let him go. So we put on this big act, you see. And we decided, we'd put on this big show, that when you're about to leave, we'd descend upon the carriage and the horses, and we'd start shouting and screaming, and not wanting to leave. I mean, we understand you've got to go, but we want to like show, so that when the next town hears about it, oh, this is a good rabbi we're getting over here. We've done well, right? And we just walked out and be like, but the fact that this community really cared about you and didn't want to leave is a good sign that we got a good, good rabbi. It's one big act. Says the Dub no Magid, that is the perfect metaphor for the fight between Moses and the angels. The angels knew that this whole Jewish thing would have to get started. That was given. That was promised to our ancestors way before the whole Exodus of Egypt and Mount Sinai experience even happened. We were told we would get the Torah. We didn't know the details. Some people maybe did. We didn't know the details. But we understood that we had this mission, this responsibility. Had the angels like, there you go. We're like, oh dear. It's a little cheap, isn't it? It's not, it's not so impressive, is it? So the angels wanted to make a demonstration. They wanted to fight back in order that we, later on in history, would be like, you know what? This whole Jewish thing? Some responsibility comes with it. It isn't all just fun and games. I mean, it's enjoyable, but it's also testing. It can also be challenging. And there's a certain chiv, a certain obligation that is enwrapped in it. Maybe that is why, this is my idea, so you can take this part or leave it, that these angelic beings were cast on top of the Ark of the Covenant, made of gold and resting on top as a sign for future generations not to forget the heavenly spiritual aspect of the contents of this box. Because what they do is they actually peer down on top of the box. That's the image that we are granted of these angelic beings on top. We are here as a reminder of that original argument that Moses had. And the ark goes to the holiest place, which is Israel. And Jerusalem, no matter what anyone tells you online, Israel has always been connected to the Jewish people. It did not start 60, 70 years ago. We've always had a connection to the land of Israel, and we've always had a connection to the city of Jerusalem, and the ark was the epicenter of it, as if to say it's here. Now, you know that wherever you are in the world when you pray, you face Israel. Right? So we here in America face east. But if you're in Iraq, which I wouldn't suggest right now. Okay, I'm just throw that out there. You know what I'm saying? Your Iraq holiday may not be. A, right? They face west. West. Towards it. When you're in Israel, you face Jerusalem. And if you're in Jerusalem, you face Temple Mount. And if you're on Temple Mount, although ironically you're not allowed to pray on Temple Mount today, you'll get arrested. But we'll leave that aside. That's another discussion. You actually face towards the Holy of Holies. And in the Holy of Holies, you face towards the Ark. That became the epicenter of Jewish life. Now, where was this ark actually housed? So there was the biggest structure called the Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple, which, you know, if you've been a birthright, you're right, there was one, right, built by King Solomon, King David's son, eventually was destroyed by the Babylonians, yep, and then after the whole Purim story, 70 years later, Darius allowed, Dariavish allowed the Jewish people to go back, Esther's son, by the way, uh, through Achshverosh, um, to actually go back and to rebuild the second temple, which took for another 410 years. Okay, eventually that was destroyed by the Romans. Right? In between, we had the Greeks, the whole Hanukkah story was in between. Then the Romans came to destroy the second temple and dispersed us. But that was always the epicenter. But it goes back before all this happened. Because when the Jewish people in the desert, we had something called the Mishkan, which is translated as a tabernacle. I don't know what a tabernacle is, but I know what the Mishkan is. Okay? And it's very, very unusual. You see, it's going to sound weird. But there was actually a plan A, and plan A didn't work, and then it turned to plan B. This happens many times in Jewish history. Plan A was that you wouldn't need a synagogue. 
Now, we kind of understand this because, you know, synagogues are part of our life. But actually, that wasn't plan A. According to the Ramban, anyway, and others, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, he says that plan A was people would be able to connect personally and wouldn't need a gathering of a people, like a synagogue or a temple or anything else. Right? You would just like want to connect spiritually wherever you were, if by yourself, it worked. You didn't need other people to lift you up. And that's how everything was set up to be. Until we made a little mistake. Do you ever know the mistake, it wasn't that it was a big mistake, the big mistake that happened that changed plan A into plan B. What mistake did the Jewish people do in the desert? The big, big mistake? Oh, we did a few actually. Very good, yes. The sin of the golden calf. Right. 40 days after, Moses went up onto the mountain. The Jewish people needed an intermediary. They weren't replacing God. They were replacing Moses because they thought he was dead. And they built a golden calf. And they worshipped, actually specifically the men. The women did not, actually. They didn't even contribute towards it. It was because of this that two things happened. Actually, many things happened. But the main two things that happened were that generation were not allowed to enter into Israel. They were forbidden to go into Israel and they had to die out in the desert, which is why we ended up 40 years in the desert. It wasn't that we didn't have GPS or as Jewish men, we weren't willing to ask for direction to get into Israel. That's not the reason. The reason is we actually forfeited the right to go in and the next generation, those who were 20 or under, from when they left Egypt, they were allowed to go in. And the women. A couple of exceptions. Joshua was one of them, but otherwise not allowed to go in. So that was one big change that happened. Right. What was the other thing? Actually, Moses was not culpable for that. He ended up hitting a rock. We'll discuss that later on in the year. Right? What problem was hitting rocks is all about. And that's why he was allowed in. Right? Because he wanted to get water. Out of it. So that was his personal thing. But the rest of them were involved and they were not allowed in. But there was something else that happened. Because of this, God said, as individuals, you're not going to be able to reach where you can. You need to have other people around you. And you need a place to go to in order to connect, shall we say. There needs to be a place you go to. That place was the Mishkan, which was a physical place. Right? Immediately, once it's physical, you know there's been some downgrading that's happened. That physical place was a physical structure, which was made up of large curtains, about the size of, I don't know, I can make it like a football field, if you will, I guess. That's the probably size we're talking about, even less, even curtains and in the middle of it then there was a menorah okay you've had a menorah right? yeah. a golden candelabra there was a altar that they would bring sacrifices on well that's about we'll see in a second there was another altar where they actually made incense not the incense they're legalizing around the country right now this was another which was a beautiful smelling spices there were 11 of them they would burn together and so you had a beautiful smell coming it was a delicious smell coming out so this fire you had this and then there was a table and on the table were 12 breads two rows of six called the lechem panim lechem panim okay then there was this wooden structure with basically large long planks of wood that was like in a box and inside that were other items and the Aaron was part of that as well behind a curtain okay? and there were beautiful tapestries colorful tapestries with animals and designs very very beautiful thing was placed on top and that's where the Kohanim the, the priests and the Levites would get involved and once a year the holiest person at the holiest time of the year would enter the holiest place and say the holiest name of God that was the high priest on Yom Kippur would enter into the Holy of Holies the only person ever allowed in Besides, anyone had to fix it. And he would walk in and he would say the, some say the fourth letter, four letter name of God, some say the 42 letter name of God, some say the 72 letter name of God, different opinions, right? And he would say it out and when people would hear it, they would freak out. They would all like pull down their faces, you know, as Jews do. And that was like the most powerful moment. It all happened around the epicenter, okay? So this is where we felt connected. This was like God's address. He wanted to feel spiritual, he went to this place. You can't do it by yourself anymore. You made that big sin with the golden calf, so now you have to like go to this place in order to feel the connection. Are you following? Okay. Let me just wrap this up a little bit. We Jews are obsessed with holy spaces, right? I perform a lot of weddings. And for a chuppah, it's a holy place. You feel the, that feeling you feel isn't like 
He anticipated the hairy chicken you're about to eat the reception, you know, like at a kosher wedding, right? It's a holy place, you know? Chicken. Yeah, yeah like hairy chickens, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Never managed to get with hair. And then you go to these, um, you go to a synagogue, you feel something there, you know what I'm saying? You feel like you're in a holy place. You go to Jerusalem, you, you feel you go to the temple, you feel it. So we Jews are into holy spaces. We are also in to holy times. Actually, we give holy times more importance than holy spaces. Holy spaces are only available in the physical world. Holy times are available in the spiritual world too. What we call uh, sanctuaries in time. So check this out, we'll finish with this last idea. And it goes like this. King Solomon, who merited to build the first temple in Jerusalem, knew somehow, wisest of all people, that eventually the temple was going to be destroyed. He knew that. He told the way. Also, those two coincidental friends have just done that. He knew this temple was going to be destroyed. And so he actually made a certain caveat. And he said, what was won't always be, and then something else will be. That's what he said. Cryptic. And there's a lot of discussion of what these words actually mean. Right? You know, smart people always talk cryptically. That's just the way it is. But he was making a reference that he knew that eventually he wouldn't be worthy to have his temple forever and it would eventually be destroyed. But what was won't be, but something else will be. So something else took over. Something else took over. Now, while the land of Israel was taken over and the land of Jerusalem was taken over, we still had time. So the thing that was going to take over was going to be a time-bound something. Now, I'm going to just go through for just a couple of minutes. I'm going to go through the different parts, and you're going to tell me what took over. You ready? There was a menorah. The menorah was light. It was lit from olive oil every single day by the high priest. Light. There was a shulchan, a table. And on the shulchan, there were breads that were freshly made every Friday and put onto this table. Not only that, there was a mizbeach, an altar, where they would bring meat. And this meat sometimes was burnt up, but usually it was eaten or given out to the priests, right, the Levites, or the giver actually would end up eating as well. So they would feel as though they're eating with God. As well as this, there was beautiful smells and fragrance that came from the incense. Not only that, there was salt they used to pour onto the meat and onto the mizbeach. And they would take wine, and they would pour wine onto the altar, onto this mezbeach, all the time as well. And inside the Holy of Holies, there was a box. We said it was a golden box. Inside that golden box was a wooden box. Inside that wooden box was another golden box. And inside that golden box were the Luchos and the first ever Torah. What, you should have figured out by now, I know you know it. What, and you wrote, what took over from the Holy Temple? Anybody? Shabbat. 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 Right, we have lights. Right, we light the lights, and we have the bread, and we have the meat, and we put salt on the table, which is a remembrance of that, and we have the wine on the table as well, and we wash our hands before eating bread, which isn't just a cleanliness washing; that's actually a holy washing that to remind us of the original washing that the Kohen used to do back in the temple as well. And there was a Torah inside the Mishkan to tell you that hey, what are you meant to do on Shabbat? What's the greatest thing you do? You sit and you learn Torah. So this holy temple, although it was destroyed and we're left with a wall that surrounds the mountain that once held the temple on top, as close as we can get, the western wall, that gets us, that's just the wall around, it's not the wall of the temple, around the mountain that surrounds it. Why that wall is special, there's, there's a southern wall, there's an eastern wall, there's a lot of walls. That particular part is actually probably the closest to where the original Aaron Ark was, so we get as close as possible. Some see it was built by poor people for poor money, it has a certain amount of importance to it, different opinions. It's in my book, Do You Got Questions? Not for now. But it wasn't always be there. And so we transferred from a place of physicality to a place of spirituality, which is Shabbat. And that's what King Solomon actually saying. If you want to have that feeling again, go to Israel. No doubt about it. But if you want to live it, then you have Shabbat. Shabbat is actually the coming together of the entire Mishkan, all the different parts of it. You can feel that one day a week. So we live in two worlds, time and space. And space can become holy. 
but we Jews, I mean, they say, a writer once wrote that Christians are very good at building cathedrals in space. We are very good at building cathedrals in time. So that's pretty, very, very beautiful. Cathedrals in time is what we Jews are into. Well, it's a synagogue. It's nice. Then I go to a synagogue and it's so nice. So a synagogue. It gets the job done. But the time itself makes it into a very holy, special place. And so eventually, it ends up impacting everything else that's physical that surrounds it. And that's what we group around. Because where do we celebrate Shabbat? In the home, yeah. We're a home-based religion. Not, as maybe we would think, I may have told you, a synagogue-based religion. We're a home-based religion. Right, because Shabbat ends up coming. The home becomes a Mikdash a small temple, a small sanctuary. So maybe that's how it all comes together <clears throat> to one complete whole. That's all the information I want to share with you this evening. Beautiful story. Thank you so much. <laughs> Any questions, thoughts, or comments? Okay. We'll stop over there. Wait, so that's where a lot of the Shabbat um, customs come from? Yes, related to that, from the Mishkan itself. Yeah. Thank you. The Shabbat customs were written in like...